uh, welcome our host, um, who is Michael Hayes. He's the president of Digital Worldwide uh, for Initiative. Um, he's one of, one of the main voices in this whole videonomics world today. He's been a key advisor for us in developing the content and the agenda and figuring out what it is, that, that, you know, the conversations and the issues that we all have to deal with. And he's gonna be your host for the next two days to help you navigate through this and make sense of the conversations and moderate as well. So everybody, please welcome Michael Hayes. <laughs> Such hip music, I love that as my intro. Um, well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Hayes and um, welcome to Orlando. This is the number one travel destination in all of the United States and uh, it, was, it was really founded by Walt Disney World. How many people have been to Walt Disney World? Everyone been to Walt Disney World in here? A lot of people. I'm actually from the West Coast, so even though I've been to Walt Disney World, my hometown was Anaheim and I grew up right next to Disneyland which was the original theme park. Walt Disney World, you may not know this, but Walt Disney World is larger than the size of San Francisco. And uh, so it's, it's, it's fairly large. It's actually built 14 feet above the surface because they have a tunnel system underneath the entire theme park to, uh, to move food and money and various other operational things that happen. Uh, and they learned that from Disneyland. Another couple interesting things about the park is that uh, every day over 200 sunglasses are turned into lost and found. So the idea is don't bring your sunglasses, you just go to lost and found and say I lost them and you can get the next pair of Ray-Bans, you know, pretty, pretty good, pretty good deal. So that's another thing. There are 62,000 employees um, here in the Orlando theme park, which makes it the largest employer, single location employer in the United States. So you're probably asking, Michael, why do I know all these little fun facts? Well, I used to be a cast member for 12 years. So this is like coming back to home. Now, I'm not certainly proud of it, but one of the things I used to do, one of the things I used to do, uh, I did a lot of things at Disney, but one of the things I used to do is I would volunteer to answer phones and guest relations. There was an ulterior motive there because the, there was a lot of girls in there, so it was always good to kind of sit next to them when you were young. Anyways, I got a call one day, and it was actually transferred me from the Disneyland Hotel in Anaheim. And a gentleman said, uh, I said, hello, uh, this is Michael, and, uh, and thank you for calling the Disneyland Resort. And he said, uh, hi, I'm in, I'm in hotel room 204, or whatever it was. And he said, I can't find the door to get out. And I said, well, okay. And he said, I opened the first door, and it was the bathroom. I opened the second door, and it was the closet. And I said, yeah. He said, the third door had a sign on it that said, do not disturb. <laughs> These are the types of things you learn when you're young, working for a theme park, that things are always a little bit more complicated for some people than others. And that's no different than the media space, I guess. So, how do you like that transition? That was good, huh, right? So, anyways, things used to be a lot simpler, right? Um, if you look behind me, this is what as a media professional on the buying side, anyways, we used to deal with. It was much, much more simpler. You had the newspaper, you had a television, you did some radio advertising. Things were a lot simpler back then and a lot easier. But today, we live in a non-demand, data-rich, multi-screen world, which all of you know about all too well. And the vast majority of these engagements for consumers across these four devices which you also know because I've heard a lot of you speak already earlier this morning. But that's the television, smartphone, tablet, uh, as well as your PC or desktop. 90% um, of all engagements. And so what's interesting about this is out of those engagements, how do we use those different devices? This is based on some research that Google did uh, a while back, which is a nice research study. The gorilla in the space in terms of online video is YouTube with over 80% market share they have over a billion uniques a month. And if you were to compare this to traditional linear television, you will see that I just did some quick math because I worked for the Disney company and I could do those types of things. So in 1948, there were three major TV networks. Um, if you count the number of years, it's 64 years. If you multiply that by 24 hours a day, it turns out that's over 1.7 million hours of television programming. On YouTube, had more content loaded up in the last two and a half weeks. 
So the point of the story is that every, every minute, 72 hours of video is uploaded to YouTube, and consumers are watching more than two billion videos a day. The interesting thing is, is this is not mass media like television. These are all micro moments because each individual video only has, by and large, if you did on average, several hundred views. So these are very, very fractionalized audiences watching little specific videos. But the point and the takeaway here is that more content was uploaded than the three TV networks since their inception. That's pretty big. Let's do a little bit deeper. And you already saw this guy. This is Gangnam in style. In nine months, 1.5 billion views. You just saw the other slide. Um, and that's amazing because that's 14 times larger. He's almost 15 times larger than the total audience of this last year's Super Bowl. 14 times larger. That's big. That's really, really big. Well, let's take a look at a little bit more. So you just saw this. This is the free fall from space. How many people have seen this? If you haven't, I would definitely watch it. It's very compelling and interesting. Um, this was YouTube's largest live stream event. This is Felix, uh, I think his last name is Gombager or something like that. Anyways, he is an Australian sky jumper. He goes up 22 miles to the edge of space, taken up by a balloon in his capsule. He literally steps out, jumps out, and skydives for 10 minutes. And he tumbles a lot, too, by the way. I was almost getting sick watching it. But he lands on the ground safely and stands up. It's an amazing video. Um, but the takeaway, again, 8.2 million live streams all at once, which makes it significantly larger than the volume of streams for the Olympics, the most previous Olympics. Big event, um, nicely done. And interestingly enough, Wired just claimed, let me read this to you. The future of TV isn't an HBO boardroom or, or a CBS studio lot, and I'm paraphrasing, it's Machinima. Machinima has 1.9 billion views a month. Uh, they're, no, they're the number one channel on YouTube, 82% are not hardcore gamers. They're casual gamers, by and large. They have over 6,000 independent producers or content creators that make up the entire channel. The question is, is this the future of TV, or is it not? So, we also know that people use devices in a much, much different way, depending on the device you use. So that relationship with these four core devices is unique. We use smartphones to keep us connected on the go. We use tablets to keep us entertained. And we use desktops to be very, very productive, much more of a utility-based uh, utility um, you know, uh, uh, machine. And of course, televisions, everyone knows what we use television for is primarily to keep us entertained and be couch potatoes, I guess. So those are different devices, which then begs a several series of questions, which sets up the rest of today, which is it really TV er everywhere? Is it really, or is it something different? As a matter of fact, is the Super Bowl equal to Machinima or equal to Gangman Style, or is it different? I would argue personally that it's much, much different. Those are two different completely events, and to compare them equally is not really fair. Number two, are we underselling the value of digital video? Are all those screens that we just talked about where 90% of all consumer touch points and engagements are happening, are those equal? And do we treat them equal? Good questions. Should we measure and value video as the same as TV? There's a session today, earlier today, by ESPN, where Adam talked about that the measurement of TV and video is broken. Be interesting later this afternoon, we have a session to talk about that specifically. What's the impact of cross-screen advertising on performance? In other words, what I mean by that is when you advertise across screen, sequentially, What's the ROI and performance for smartphones versus a tablet versus television connected TVs and the like? Those are interesting analytical questions that all of us will have to grapple with in the agency business as well as advertisers and publishers. And can the current financial model, speaking of videonomics, can this current new video ecosystem be sustained over the long haul given the challenges of the cost of developing content versus the volume of advertising or the ad-supported model? All really, really good questions. So with that, we're gonna ask a lot of these questions of a good friend of mine, and uh, he's from ESPN. Mr. King, why don't you come up? 
We'll have a little fireside chat. ESPN, if you would welcome them.